Shall we start? Okay. Yeah, I think we're good to go. Assalamu uh, alaikum and hello everybody. Fatma Farsi from Sultan Qabus University. I'm um, president of the USB student chapter. I'm so happy to see that number of participants in the webinar. First of all, uh, I would like to welcome our guest for today, Engineer Mohammed Blushi, Oman Reservoir Engineer at BP, who holds a Master in Reservoir uh, Geoscience and Engineering from uh, IFP School and Bachelor in Petroleum Engineering from Texas A&M University at Qatar. He was selected by Total, New York Times, and Energy Intelligence as energy uh, leader for tomorrow resident. He joined BP as a reservoir engineer in challenge uh, program at UK for uh, New Zero Ambitious. Also appointed uh, as SPE Middle East and North Africa liaison for Gaia Sustainability Program. Okay, uh, now enjoy your time with him. If you have any questions, please feel, feel free to write it down in the comment section. Or you can unmute your mic uh, to ask him at the end of the webinar. Please mention the slide number to make it easy for us to uh, to know which what you mean uh, by your question. Wow! Thank you so much, uh, Fatma, for that uh, very uh, diligent introduction, um, and uh, to you all today for uh, attending uh, this webinar. Uh, and it's about a topic that is um, not really uh, of of the of the sort that we get. Um, uh, a lot of exposure to uh, within our subsurface disciplines, um, or even uh, the engineering programs that we uh, uh, take on in, uh, in our academic uh, involvements. And so um, I thought it would be a good opportunity um, to uh, introduce um, the attendees today to a uh, concept of CCUS um, and uh, talk a little bit about uh, also uh, clean energy parks and what that means uh, in this presentation. Uh, as uh, Fatma mentioned, uh, I'm a reservoir engineer at BP. Um, and recently appointed uh, as, uh, as the uh, Guy Sustainability Program Liaison uh, in Middle East and North Africa. Uh, and so that explains the logo, I suppose, in the bottom of the slides. Um, but before I start, actually, I just wanted to uh, really recognize uh, the efforts that have been made by the uh, Stan Qabus University chapter um, uh, across the board uh, from you know, all of the members, uh, the leadership, uh, but also uh, the diligent work behind the scenes um, that takes place to make sure that all these events and initiatives are carried out. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'll go ahead to my uh, outline slide. Uh, I've used this uh, before, actually, in uh, one of the webinars, uh, and it was uh, found to be very useful, um, sort of a constructed roadmap of today's webinar. And so um, I'm not sure, I think we have an hour today, so uh, my aim is to spend around 20, 25 minutes, uh, maybe 30 minutes, um, speaking to you about these four uh, different uh, parts of the presentation uh, and then opening up for Q&A. And this is the part where I'm most excited about because I would love to hear um, what your thoughts are and, and get a discussion going. Uh, but first and foremost, we'll talk about uh, what CCUS is. Um, why do we need it? Why is it important to us? Um, and what opportunities are there for storage? Um, in the space of, of, of CCS or CCUS. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about technical challenges um, and the economic feasibility about it as well. Um, and then really show you um, an area that I'm really excited about. Um, it's a concept that has um, uh, not been publicized until very recently um, with uh, the uh, North Endurance Partnership uh, announcement by uh, BP and the major companies. Uh, but it's the clean energy park concept and I'm, I'm very excited to show it today. On top of that, obviously, I'll show a field example of, of net zero T side uh, and the work that's been going on in the UK, uh, but also, um, you know, uh, give a perspective of what the global uh, picture looks like as well. And then open up for, uh, for a Q&A discussion. So um, hopefully that will round us off very well. So um, really, uh, the, the question um, at the forefront of everybody's minds right now is, what is CCUS um, or CCS for that matter? And why do we need it? Um, I'm sure a lot of you must have read the um, abstract of the lecture itself uh, and must have seen that um, you know, uh, CCS stands for uh, carbon capture and storage. Um, essentially, you know, uh, the, the feedstocks, um, as you can see here uh, on the left-hand side, if I use my uh, laser pointer, the feedstocks are the natural gas, the waste and the biomass. Now, these are sources 
of carbon dioxide. Um, and when we process them um, and they're combusted, business as usual is to um, let them go, go and release the atmosphere. Uh, but as we uh, now are learning uh, in, in this environment and with uh, emissions, uh, how important it is to mitigate those, um, carbon capture and storage technology is one that helps us capture that carbon dioxide that's produced as a byproduct uh, of, of the natural gas and the hydrocarbons that we uh, extract from the subsurface. And instead of emitting them to the atmosphere um, as atmospheric or flue gas, uh, we can allow them to be safely stored uh, geologically uh, deep in the underground in the geological stores. Um, and so uh, the, the process of doing so is called carbon capture and storage. Now there's a U in the CCUS. Um, people often ask me what, what the U is for. Um, and, and U is, is essentially for usage um, or utilization. Um, and so, you know, sometimes you can use CO2 in commercial processes. Um, you know, uh, the, the one, one element that we're very familiar with um, within the context of, of upstream oil and gas is, is using CO2 uh, for enhanced oil recovery. Um, we can inject uh, that CO2 back into the subsurface um, and mobilize the hydrocarbons that are uh, remaining and, and help uh, them be swept. And so that is a process that we can utilize the CO2 in. Uh, but it goes beyond that. It goes into, um, you know, chemical processes, food processing, um, and, and feedstock to produce valuable carbon um, related products. So um, the only issue, however, with that is that um, the amount of CO2 that we're producing far, far exceeds um, the demand that we have for it. And so um, it is worth keeping that in mind, uh, but whenever it exists, it's worth evaluating also. Why is this important? Um, now, if you take a look at the chart here on the right hand side, um, it, it is um, sourced by uh, the UC San Diego uh, research institution over there, um, and it shows you the concentration of CO2 over time um, and how it has risen, um, especially over the past um, 40 years, um, you know, really uh, just an exponential rise um, of, of CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And what has resu resulted as a result of that is their increase um, since 1960 or since the 1900s actually uh, of um, 1.14 degrees Celsius, most of which has come from the last 40 years. And it's also worth noting that uh, over the past six years, we've recorded the highest temperatures on record in every year. So every year breaking the record from the previous year with the exception of 2016. So the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, got together. This is a unique partnership between uh, governments and scientific communities. Um, and decided to um, create um, uh, a partnership that is based on not being policy, policy prescriptive, but policy substantive. Um, the, main sort, the main aim of which is to keep uh, the, the emissions um, uh, to, to a minimum, to be able to meet the targets of um, 1.5 degrees Celsius rise by mid-century. So um, the aim was to keep it below 2 degrees Celsius, but at least um, the, the primary target was 1.5. Obviously, this is also a figure that's confirmed by, uh, by NASA, just showing the, the atmospheric increase uh, in carbon dioxide volumes uh, in the atmosphere. And as you can see here, this is a, a very interesting schematic that's shown by um, IEA, actually, the International Energy Agency, um, giving you the world outlook. And so if you, if you look at the... Um, the figure here, you'll see that by 2019, you have around 32 gigatons of CO2 per year um, released to the atmosphere. Now, if you continue with the stated policy scenario, um, you're going to see a, a, a slower um, you know, rise, uh, a more steady um, increase, but still not in line with meeting the Paris goals uh, and reducing global emissions. And so this one, however, the sustainable development scenario helps you get there and you and you are able to accomplish that by, by different levers, one of which is CCUS. CCUS plays an important role uh, in doing that. Um, and, you know, uh, one thing that is important to recognize with CCUS is that it gives you the benefit of, of sort of being able to continue with the operations right now as is with oil and gas, uh, but mitigating the emissions that come with that. 
So now that you have learned what CCUS is and why is it important to us, um, we ask ourselves this question, what enables a successful CCS project? And for me, the, there are four main pillars uh, to accomplish that. Um, you have a government policy, um, and you know we've spoken about how IPCC was a unique partnership between governments uh, and, and scientific communities um, to really put forth agendas uh, that uh, help us lower our emissions. Uh, but really, um, you know, in terms of supporting CCUS activities, you're looking at uh, financial incentives, um, i.e. government subsidies, um, you know, uh, really fostering an environment that encourages um, the investors that are coming into a country um, to have that sort of precursor of, of, of capturing the carbon and storing it. Um, you also promote social development programs that aim at raising awareness uh, about the importance of capturing that, that carbon and storing it. And, you know, uh, having learned this very recently, um, we are in the business of making money. So we have to also profit uh, from, from, you know, uh, carrying out these projects. And so there has to be a viable business model. It links to government policies, of course, because we're not at a time where we have um, the technological advancement uh, be uh, such that you're able to, uh, to, uh, to carry out these projects without the incentives from the government and the policies that are put forth. But then the, the two ones below, uh, which are more technical, um, we're talking about sources of CO2. So, you know, you, you obviously need to have a source uh, whereby you are, in, you know, pr producing that CO2 and you're emitting it. Um, and you know, contrary to public belief, actually, the more sources, the better. So when you have a, you know, sources that are closely linked to one another and they're within close proximity, um, it becomes more viable for you economically to actually um, have a hub and whereby you're, you know, you're, um, you're linking all these sources together um, and you're uh, building a pipeline system, a transportation system to be able to put them into sinks. Um, sinks is very simply a geological store um, in the subsurface, um, whether it's onshore or offshore, um, that has the appropriate features um, to be able to allow you to inject that carbon uh, dioxide uh, back into um, the subsurface. Whenever we speak about uh, CCS, we, we, I know we use carbon capture, but really we're talking about CO2, um, which is a byproduct of, of um, the hydrocarbon uh, production. So um, now that I've spoken about sinks, I know that the, um, the the cynic in some of the some of the attendees, or or perhaps even you know the ones that have learned a lot about geology uh, in the context of petroleum engineering, reservoir engineering, um, geophysics, will immediately think of a sink as what is a sink? Is it a trap? Um, not really. Um, I mean that is the uh, first thought that comes to mind. Uh, but it's important to understand the similarities um, and the differences between a conventional trap and a carbon trap. So I want to attract your attention to the right-hand side of the screen and, and take a look at this schematic. Um, there's a funny story behind this one. This was actually drawn on the back of a napkin um, in one of the uh, CO2 meetings where they discussed the evolution of the trap. Um, and, you know, whenever you store CO2 in the subsurface, um, immediately after you inject, we always think of structural or stratigraphic trapping. So we think of um, the, the, the shape of the trap and how it's going to help us, um, you know, sort of uh, have, that, have that accumulation of CO2 within the subsurface, uh, within the store. But over time, um, you know, you're going to have the solution and you're going to have residual face trapping uh, come into the fore. Um, and then over a significantly larger period of time, uh, you're going to st start having these uh, dissolved CO2 uh, reacting chemically so essentially a reaction between the carbonates and the minerals um, to be, uh, you know, uh, main influences and drivers of that trapping uh, mechanism. So it's important to understand, especially here in this schematic where you see the, um, uh, the, the CO2 plume and how it's moving with the aquifer, uh, with the water. Um, you know, it's dissolved in some respects here, but it's also a residual CO2. So Immediately in the aftermath of injecting CO2, you would have structural stratigraphic trapping be the influence, uh, but then later on in the storage life, um, you would have these other types of trapping mechanisms uh, become much more uh, relevant. Now, from a technical point of view, um, what characterizes a good storage behavior? Um, in my mind, there are three things. 
you have containment, and containment refers to sealant trapping, as I've spoken about in the earlier part of this slide. And then you have capacity. So this is really about predicting um, the, the reservoir performance. So the rate, uh, the volume, understanding those, um, the injection rate, um, you know, in a given store, uh, how much it can cope with. And then the monitorability, so monitoring its performance over time. It's worth noting that there are three different types of, of, of um, repositories or storage spaces for, uh, for CCUS or, or carbon uh, dioxide. Um, you have a saline aquifer, so you have, uh, that's the type one uh, aquifer. Um, and this is the one where you tend to really, um, you don't necessarily have a lot of information about it because it's not a reservoir that you've extracted hydrocarbons from. Um, uh, but it also means that the produced zone will be, you know, you need to safely be able to now dispose of, of additional sources of pressure. Because, you know, one thing that us petroleum engineers and, and reservoir engineers and, 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 you know, all of the people on subsurface um, often um, work with is we are in decreasing the pressure of the reservoir. So we are extracting hydrocarbons and decreasing the pressure. Uh, but in CCUS, you're actually doing the opposite. So you're increasing the pressure of the, of the overburden of subsurface. And so with that, you have to, uh, you know, have good pressure management systems, um, maybe drill an injection well to, to extract some of the brine um, to be able to manage the pressure uh, because you're injecting dense phase CO2 back into the subsurface. You have another type of saline aquifers, so it's called migration assistance storage, and this is more, you don't have a clearly defined anticline, rather you have it be um, as a plume uh, and you have migration uh, of 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 the um, of the water that has dissolved CO two in it, so it's important to be able to um, uh, characterize this widespread storage and look for sources of leakage, uh, and be able to mitigate those. With depleted fields, of course, we have the most amount of information about those fields because we've depleted them and we're able to inject carbon dioxide back into the uh, uh, into those fields. Uh, but one thing that we have to realize is that not all seals are created equal, um, and and you may have an understanding of your seal uh, before you have before you start your production from this from this uh, you know uh, reservoir. Uh, but when you are um, producing that hydrocarbon, you're changing the stress uh, regimes uh, within the uh, the reservoir itself. So you're also uh, altering the uh, the features of the seal, uh, and you don't know now if the seal that you have after the fact is going to be the type that is going to be able to hold the CO2 um, that you're injecting back, the dense space CO2. So really, these, these, these things are really, really important to, to keep in mind um, as, as some technical challenges, I would say, and limitations. Um, being able to maintain the seal integrity um, and understanding it um, is, is crucial. Now onto the economics. Um, people often wonder, um, is it really uh, economic to, uh, to store CO2? Um, you know, is, is it realistic though? It sounds, it sounds, it sounds crazily expensive uh, to be able to capture CO2 and inject it back into the ground. And, and the simple answer, yes, it is. Yes, it is expensive um, in the current landscape. Um, and this was, this is a, a table that I've actually um, devised with, uh, with a colleague of mine. Uh, we used uh, Market Insider as a source and we were just playing around with numbers. We were a little bit uh, bored after one working day. And so we're like, okay, let's just look at the, the prices of, um, well, the current cost of, of each of these um, energy sources and how much it would actually um, cost to abate them. Um, so abatement is really um, the term that we use for um, the price after actually um, taking that CO2, compressing it uh, and storing it back in subsurface. Um, so if you take a look here, um, you know, if you can imagine that you could capture, compress, and sequester all the CO2 at an assumed price of $80 per ton of CO2, um, then, you know, you have, you have this cost right now uh, for natural gas. It's $2.8 per MMBTU uh, as per the current Henry Hub price. If you are able to capture all the CO2 and, and store it um, from that natural gas, the cost per MMBTU of natural gas would be 6.7. So that's an increased factor of about 2.4, there or thereabout. For oil, um, current price, uh, Brent price, 40, you would abate it and you'd be 74. Um, so that's an increased factor about around about two. Uh, for coal, look, it's, it's, it's a lot more um, expensive to actually 
um, abate um, CO2. So if you're looking at a price of $51 uh, per ton, uh, you'd be looking at an increased factor of 5.7. And um, and just to just to really show you another version of this table, but you know, lining them all up in the same unit, so MMBTU, um, it's you're still going to see that you know uh, with coal. Uh, you're going to have that same increased factor uh, when you abate the carbon um, dioxide that comes with the coal itself. Uh, so it is it is pretty substantial. Um, that said, it is the least cost route to net zero. So if that's what we're going to, um, or or meeting the, the terms of the Paris Agreement, uh, then it is part of the, the you know the least cost lesser cost ways to get there. Now, um, is there a place for abated coal? Uh, I would I would say maybe um, you know especially when you talk about energy security or or local jobs um, uh, there is a place for that kind of thing but for it to be competitive at an international uh, on a global scale um, it's it's far better to abate uh, natural gas look uh, I mean abating coal is going to give you a price of around 10.3 per mmbtu so a much larger increase factor so. Um, it's therefore much better to abate um, natural gas in comparison to coal. Before I uh, I close and open up for questioning is is the Northern Endurance Partnership. So, um, you know, you might have seen in the news actually a couple of weeks ago there was an announcement um, uh, and and, a, and a, a massive agreement actually between um, six large energy providers uh, to develop offshore infrastructure that transports and stores millions of, of tons of CO two. Um, in the North Sea continental shelf. So um, the, the structure that is now being looked at is the Endurance Sea Line Aquifer. And uh, the two projects are Net Zero Teesside and, and Zero Carbon Humber. Um, these are industrial hubs that together produce more than 25% of CO2 um, in, in the UK alone. Um, you know, you're talking about 12.4 tons, million tons of, of, um, of CO2 from Humber and then five you know, uh, you know, more than five or six um, from Teesside. So it's a huge amount of CO2 that's being produced uh, or emitted from these two industrial hubs. So BP is operating this on behalf of uh, uh, the consortium uh, and OGCI. Um, and, but you have also partners uh, uh, from the likes of ENI, Equinor, National Grid and Shell and Total. And this is really the, um, the, the way it looks. So um, net zero Teesside is going to consist of um, having to construct uh, essentially um, a, a power station, a whole new power station, um, some CCS equipment, uh, building pipeline networks that connect to uh, the saline aquifer um, uh, system, uh, subsea system, as called endurance. And and the idea is to really uh, connect it to um, uh, to some you know some of the fertilizer um, uh, stations, uh, also plans to expand into hydrogen uh, in the future. But this is all part of UK's commitment um, to uh, achieve uh, net zero by by 2050, and and the budget that is allocated to be able to do this. Um, this will be launched in 2026 uh, with an aim to achieve net zero across the system uh, as early as 2030. So um, really exciting, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, development that's actually being run by, by BP at the moment. And you can read actually more about this in, in the Net Zero T-Side um, documentation that they have um, public. Um, but it's not all about the UK, certainly not. Um, there's a lot of uh, projects that are going on in the world right now, um, especially, you know, I, I can only speak for uh, the ones that we have uh, within within BP, but there's, you know, you're looking at the North America, there's a lot of activity there um, in, in, you know, in the Midwest hub and the Northern Plains. Uh, Trinidad also, even though it's not right now on the uh, on the map of large scale CCS facilities, uh, because this is not updated as of 2019, but Trinidad is also um, an area that has a large gas processing facility. So we're looking at as that, um, uh, you know, as, as a viable um, uh, hub also for, for uh, CCUS piloting projects. You have the, uh, the JV, the joint venture between Equinor, um, BP and Sonatrac in, in Algeria um, with the Insala, um, uh, you know, a uh, field that actually right now is in, uh, in post-injection pre-closure pre-closure monitoring phase. So, and obviously Oman is an area that uh, 
that is being looked at very uh, very intensely right now as as a candidate um, for for a CCUS project. But at the moment, you only have uh, I think one in the UAE uh, and and a couple I think in uh, in Saudi Arabia or, or one at the moment. But uh, I think this uh, there was an, a, a a campaign or initiative to have another project be piloted uh, in 2020. Before I uh, close up and open up for questioning, uh, I just wanted to show you actually this slide. Uh, and this slide is, is, uh, is, uh, is a feel good slide. That's how I call it. Um, for the ones in the call who are from subsurface um, or they're taking any you know, reservoir engineering, production engineering, uh, petroleum engineering, geology. Um, what I want to what I show is, is there are many crossovers uh, between oil and gas and CCS um, in terms of skill sets um, and processes. Um, this is a pseudo event diagram. Um, I, I call it that really because, you know, um, unless we're going to purposefully um, exclude certain possibilities for storage, pretty much every um, subdiscipline within oil and gas um, is needed for CCUS. Um, and so every skill to a certain extent, the, the degree of which you can argue, but every skill actually is really important. Petrophysics, uh, geomodeling, um, routine, routine core analysis, um, even PVT characterizing that uh, and, and honoring it in the model. Uh, these are all really important for CCS. Now, there are a few um, that are outside the scope of, of uh, the skills that we have. Um, uh, those are, you know, ge some geochemistry that you might need, mineral physics, uh, stability monitoring. So um, these are significant skills um, that, you know, uh, help teach us about the hydrodynamic features of, of the, of the uh, aquifers that we're injecting the CC, uh, the, the carbon dioxide in. And so, you know, given the uh, hyper saline properties of the saline aquifers, um, it's important to understand the permeability of these fluids um, and how the injection schemes um, are being set up. And so, and there's also a large amount of, of uh, geomechanical assurance uh, that has to go into uh, when we inject gas into a saline aquifer, you know, because as I mentioned, we are increasing the reservoir pressure. Uh, and so it's important to be able to manage that. What we also have to understand is that these are very large repositories. So it's important to monitor uh, their chronological um, dynamic behavior over time, um, or you know, chronological is over time, but it's important to be able to monitor their behavior over time um, and, and make sure that we're verifying constantly our predicted models um, and, and uh, that they're performing as projected. That's really key. And we do that through several techniques. Uh, one of the techniques is, is really shown by the gentleman on the right hand side. Uh, what he's doing is actually, um, you know, inserting an aquifer geochemical uh, sampling tool um, to extract fluid properties. Um, and that will help us interpret how the aquifer is behaving over time. Um, and so, um, you know, this is a very useful um, technique, but uh, there is many uh, um, that help us uh, both measure it and then verify it with our models. Um, I think that's all I had to say. I'm a little bit tired of hearing my own voice. Um, thank you all for uh, for listening and taking the time to attend again. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm 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 really looking forward to your questions. So um, go ahead, please, and and fire away. Uh, thanks, Mohammed, uh, a lot for sharing with us all these uh, informations. It was a rich, uh, super informative, almost half an hour uh, talk about the CCUS. Excellent. Uh, I was actually tracking uh, the audience questions and interactions in the comment box. So thanks for all who did participate. And uh, I do have, yes, I do have some uh, questions for you, uh, Mohammed, from the comment box. So are you ready? Yes. So there is a question no, from ahead. Iman uh, Al Fazari. Yeah. yeah. So there is a question from Iman Al Fazari. She's saying that. Uh, can storing CO2 in the offshore cause, um, cause leaks and affecting the marine creatures? That's a good question. That's a really good question. First of all, thank you uh, so much, Iman, uh, for asking that. Good to hear from you. Um, indeed. So uh, when you're injecting uh, into um, offshore um, structures, um, like the one that we talked about with endurance um, and, and the marine life. You know, if you go to that slide and look at the endurance sea light aquifer here. Uh, one thing you need to, to realize is that we don't have as big of an understanding of the saline aquifers as we do of the depleted fields, for example. And so um, whether it's a accumulation that is uh, conventional 
uh, a conventional type trap or it's a plume, um, there is leakage that could happen um, uh, not only from the seal not being sufficient enough to hold that CO2 that's dissolved in the water, in the brine, uh, but also, you know, we typically use old wells to actually inject that CO2 back into the subsurface. Um, so, you know, the casing history of these wells, um, understanding what's also the abandonment history, um, uh, because they used to be producers, for example, if they were producers before, um, and, and being able to, to characterize if we have any potential leaks from the tubing itself, but also from, from the, from the uh, structure uh, and not having a sufficient seal capacity. So, and this really speaks back to um, uh, the, the skill that you have to acquire um, through the geomechanical modeling um, and, and also understanding the hydrodynamic behavior of, the, of those aquifers that we're injecting back into the, uh, into the subsurface. Um, that is really important because if you have leakage, um, it could really be destructive to the marine life, uh, as, you, as you quite rightly point out and mentioned. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Ahmed. I hope, uh, Iman, you get satisfied with the answer. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so attendees, if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to ask in the comment box or you can open uh, your mic and speak up. Okay, Fatma Farsi, she have uh, something uh, to add. So Fatma, go ahead. Fatma. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I have something to add in slide uh, 10. As you said, there are some uh, uh, skills that uh, must be uh, there wh while you are studying the CCS technology and you are implementing the CCS. Uh, CCS. Uh, sometimes, sometimes you also say that the whole CCS technology is too uh, futuristic or yeah, something is like a myth or under misunderstanding of the whole story of CCS. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. sometimes they say that, like uh, it has not been tested on or it may uh, maybe it will never work or, or, but I think the, the whole story of CCS is it comes after the studying of the reservoir itself the the, uh, the physical uh, side of it and there's no worrying about that I think Absolutely. Um, so, you know, one thing that uh, is often a challenge with, with CCS is that, um, you know, we, we make, we tend to make a big financial investment decisions um, in a typical oil and gas, um, uh, you know, contract or operation very early on. And so we acquire more information as we go. Uh, we obtain information about seismic properties um, and we try to understand um, how the repository behaves over time in terms of the seal capacity. Um, with with the CCS, it's it's a it's a it's a challenge because you are in a tougher cost environment. The system balancing costs are not the same as you know the the, the cost of rent uh, and and getting a return rate on return uh, is lower in, in CCUS as as a typical oil and gas field that you would have. So uh, there is a challenge with being able to characterize um, the performance of your storage um, and how it can behave dynamically over time. This is why we are more comfortable now with depleted fields um, rather than saline aquifers. Uh, but uh, when, when you talk about um, like uh, the skills and processes, I can tell you for, for certain that we are using the same interfaces um, uh, for, for characterizing a potential store for carbon capture and storage. So for example, we are using the trial or um, you know, uh, tech log for, for the for the uh, log properties of of uh, of, of a, uh, a certain well that we're going to use for um, uh, for or particularly like you know the the static properties of a, of, a, of a structure and being able to understand how it will behave with time um, when we combine that obviously with with uh, with modeling uh, dynamic modeling um, how it behaves over time uh, when we inject that CO two back in subsurface so. Uh, it, it is a challenge, uh, and I can see that. One other thing as well is that, you know, oftentimes uh, there is also the challenge of of transporting that that C, CO2. Um, you know, if you talk about um, our block in, in Oman and, and, and Khazan and Ghazir, um, you, what you need to find is you need to find a viable store 
um, in close proximity to the areas in which you're producing in. Otherwise, you're going to have to talk about the liquef liquef liquefying that carbon dioxide, transporting it, and then degasifying it again. Um, so, so obviously, these are all things that you have to take in mind and uh, and you have to consider. Um, I will add one last thing that I might have not had the chance to mention. Actually, it was. Uh, um, uh, part of my notes that I actually spoke about. There's a challenge about in injecting that that dense phase of the CO2. So um, you know, like like uh, Iman mentioned in her question, there are leak paths. Um, there are ge geomechanical impacts on the faults and fractures. You know, uh, when you are changing the stress regime, so you need to understand what's happening in subsurface. Um, so that with the cost is makes it a big challenge in comparison to oil and gas fields. Uh, absolutely. Thank you. Hope that Thank you, for that. Yes, yes, I think no you did. Yeah. So, Ahmed Al Busaidi, he left a comment for you. Uh, he's saying that really interesting explanation of CCUS, really appreciated. So, thank you, Ahmed, for your comment. Thank you, Ahmed. Hope you enjoyed we, the, the, the webinar. Appreciate it. Thank you. Another comment from Iman, she's saying that thank you, Engineer Mohammed, uh, for the informative webinar. I, re I really enjoy it. Thank you all. Um, uh, this uh, warms my heart. I appreciate uh, all, the, all the comments. Uh, go ahead, please. Um, who do we have? Mohammed, uh, the mic is with you. Go ahead. I, I mean, Ahmed, Ahmed Shibani. Yes. Thank you. That's a great question, and I think it also speaks to um, one of the uh, points that I've uh, I've tried to you know sort of emphasize uh, is it's important to have um, large um, amounts or volumes of CO2 uh, from the sources nearby um, that enable you to create that hub um, and and bring uh, bring that capturing equipment and storage equipment um, that's able to compress the CO2 and then uh, send it to the injector wells um, and and make the whole process economically viable. In terms of the equipment, so you mentioned the, the injector wells uh, for CO2. Now um, we are able to use old producer wells. Now we have to evaluate, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the 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 casing history, the construction of the well itself, if it's uh, compatible with uh, injecting CO2 back into subsurface. Um, it's it's a little bit more um, challenging um, right now from a technical capability perspective because um, CO2 will require in instances um, standalone wells that will be required they will just be used primarily for injecting co2 um, so the the cost of abating carbon as you saw in the economical slide we are right now hovering at you know 80 dollars per per ton uh, of co2 so in short answer yes it is it is expensive at the current um, technological um, stage of, of of the equipment that we have um, it, it is much easier to use um, old producers for injecting water in the subsurface uh, and, and having them close proximity to production wells, producing wells. Um, that is more of an established um, sort of methodology than, than what we have for CO2. Uh, for CO2, we have to characterize the leakage um, pathways, the abandonment history, um, uh, like I mentioned, like also the properties of where we're, uh, of, these, of the structure that we inst we're injecting CO2 back into and whether it'll be, able, it'll be able to hold that CO2. Because the idea is that you also, you wanna be able to have that CO2 be safely stored for a thousand plus years, right? Um, and, and be geologically safely stored over time. Um, so you don't want to just inject it back and, and have it uh, cause any leaks, uh, you know, 20, 30 years from now. Uh, now, uh, the, the onus is on operators, on energy companies, to put forth a, convic a convincing case um, 
uh, that to the state or the country uh, that they're able to take ownership of doing this even beyond the contract that they have uh, for the oil and gas field, right? Because they are they are responsible for that injection process also uh, of CO2 back in subsurface. So I hope as that answers your question. But yeah, it is it is a very costly process at the moment. So, so I, I recognize, I think I appreciate actually, uh, thank you for the question. I recognize that uh, this, um, uh, the way that I had the uh, CCUS um, row set up made it uh, slightly deceiving in the sense that it made it sound like it's the, like it's, it's, a, it's a standalone cost here. Uh, but what I'm actually trying to refer to here is that this is the assumed uh, price uh, of, of uh, injecting CO2 back into the, in the subsurface per ton of CO2. So when we incorporate that, um, into natural gas, oil, and coal, that's the difference between unabated and abated. So, so you know, these these costs here that you see are costs where we've added this, this cost of CCOS to the natural gas and oil and coal um, to have the whole, you know, sort of uh, um, estimate of what the cost would be um, of natural gas after you abate it, uh, after you remove the CO2 from it and you compress it and you store it back to surface. So if you think about a project um, where you have a contract and the contract is five dollars per MMBTU, um, you're being paid by you know uh, the government or the customers or the stakeholders, um, and the cost of you producing natural gas is two point eight, um, or or lower potentially than that. But if you're you're selling it at five, it's economic. Um, but if you're abating it, then it would cost you the whole system would cost you 6.7. So you're not actually making money, you're losing money because you're making $5 for every $6.7 uh, that you're spending. Um, and that just doesn't make economic sense. Now, you're, the, to talk about injecting CC, uh, CO2, uh, excuse me, with, with natural gas and oil, um, interesting, but I, I, you know, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't really, I mean, these are, uh, these are sources of energy that we need to utilize. So injecting them back in the subsurface with CO2 um, is, is not really going to, um, because we're injecting it back for storage purposes. So I, you know, I, I do know of, of cases where you have natural gas being stored in summer months or actually, yeah, in summer months and then having them be ready for winter months in some of the Western countries. Um, but I, I, I haven't really um, looked into actually like whether you would have any cases of, of, of blends of fluids between CO2 and natural gas and oil. Uh, but it's interesting I'll, I'll look, to look into it, that. To that. Um, thanks for the question, Ahmed. Um, but, but just to clear up here, th this is a standalone cost of CO2 uh, being stored back into subsurface. And once I incorporate it into one of these three, it causes the price to go from unabated to abated. So this is, means it's, it's incorporating the CO2 actually with it. Um, at the cost, assumed cost of $80, ton, $80 per ton of CO2. Hope that answers your question. It is, it is, no, absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, we are all, by the way, um, uh, learning um, as we go in this space. Uh, this is very, very new, not just to you guys, but also to us in subsurface. Um, we are uh, learning as we go. Uh, and the more knowledge that we acquire, the more we want to share with everybody. And and also the more, you know, uh, these projects become feasible uh, from a technological standpoint and also from a capability standpoint from the people that we have. Um, so thank you for the question. Um, always, always keen to listen to that. 
Um, I'll make a, I'll make a note of that actually. Um, look into that. Thank you, Ahmed. All uh, oil and gas companies, so no more problem yeah. with the CO2. Okay. So, do you think that we will continue on the energy transition track by minimizing investment in coal and oil? That's a good question. By Thanks. minimizing investment in coal and oil. Uh, yeah. So, so in this scenario, we are imagining that all of the uh, uh, CCUS uh, adaptation is coming from natural gas. Is that the question, uh, Al Hassan? Uh, adopted by oil and gas companies. I, uh, he's saying that if okay, um, oil and gas companies. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Gotcha. Understood. Understood. Um, the simple question, the simple answer is is no. Um, just just because uh, CCUS is part of the solution. Uh, now we are seeing how big a part it is for the solution. We are we are evaluating that. We're a constant process of doing so. Um, obviously, as I mentioned in the economic slide, it is uh, the, the the least um, costly route to achieving net zero um, in the current landscape. So with you know with solar and and, and biomass and and wind uh, and and all these other sources of of of, of energy, uh, renewable energy. Uh, but that will not mean that if we're able to actually, um, you know, carry out CCUS at scale, it doesn't mean that we're, we'll be able to achieve the, um, uh, the sustainable development scenario uh, in line with Paris Climate Agreement through only CCUS. CCUS is part of the uh, solution. And it's, you know, in, the, in one of the projections, it says 9%, but um, it, it, it cannot alone uh, get you to net zero. Um, reshaping your portfolio as an energy company uh, and looking at um, a more balanced, um, you know, uh, sources of energy that you're providing uh, will help uh, get us there, you know, with renewables, with solar, with wind, um, being able to develop the technological innovation that makes these um, uh, applications viable from an economic standpoint. And having the skills, you know, where, where, where we lack skills, we're hiring skills um, outside of, you know, the existing um, workforce that are people and skills and capabilities that we have. So simple answer is no. Uh, but thank you for the question. Uh, it has a really, really insightful question. And again, that's that's my opinion. Um, I don't speak on behalf of my employer, but that, that is the picture as it stands. It has to be a balance between all the energy sources and, and all of the applications. Um. So, uh, Fatma, just we have uh, more uh, two further questions. Shall we move on and look at them, or we end? Ah, okay. I think four questions uh, from uh, Maryam uh, is already answered by Mohammed. But but the last part of her questions, I think, um, it's good to ask. She's okay. Asking, so, yeah, okay. about so fluid installations. Does that I mean, the CO2 injection uh, will affect on the, or the fluids uh, already inside the reservoir will affect on the, the process of injection of CO2. I think they, what she means in her question. If you think if there's any more questions, and Huda also yourself, um, I, I will provide my, uh, my email address to, uh, to uh, the team, and uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, yes. and ask any more questions. If it's about CCUS or reservoir engineering in general, uh, I'm happy to, to oblige. Uh, but thank you so much for, uh, for all the questions and listening today. Yes, that's great. We're finishing up. There is no more questions, actually. So OK. OK. Thank you, Engineer Mohammed, for sharing this insightful uh, information with us. And also, thanks Absolutely. to all attendees. Um, hope to see you again, inshallah, in the upcoming webinars. Uh, thank you so much.